And it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Martin Cornif, who's uh, one of the directors of the Max Planck in Cologne. He's going to talk to us about natural variation in Arabidopsis. Okay, thanks for the invitation to speak at this meeting. Uh, I also was asked to start with a few general slides, which I will, uh, hope it's not something you all know uh, about how to use, how to exploit Arabidopsis natural variation. And I will zoom into one example of, let's say, I would like to call the complexity of, uh, of quantitative traits. So, the idea of natural variation is, is that you uh, study not mutants in Columbia, Landsberg background only, but that you are exploiting, make use of the variation that uh, is present in nature. And Arabidopsis is really growing in large parts of the world. And we, that suggests there is adaptation to local environments, I should say suggest. It's not so often proven, uh, but it's really from, from yeah, this is my family here uh, in front of me because I was collecting Arabidopsis over here. And this is uh, Tajikistan, uh, th three and a half thousand meters above sea level and all variation in between. Um, so that, that is intriguing. How can we use the genetic differences which exist there uh, to, to study natural variation? And so, so this, this has a number of steps. You start with, of course, a collection of accessions, and there are thousands of them uh, present. We have, uh, only in the Netherlands, we collected more than 2,000 accessions, and that's a small country only. Um, and, um, yeah, then you can do a number of genetic analysis, uh, genome wide association mapping that was also mentioned briefly by Maria, uh, is, is, is a way to work directly with these accessions. You, of course, have to pheno genotype them and, of course, phenotype them, but you can also work with mapping populations, and then you try to identify the genes that differ, that segregate in your population, and often these are quantitative, quantitative trait loci, um, so more traits, more genes, loci control your trait, not a single uh, locus as in a mutant approach, try to clone these genes, figure out if you can, uh, what is really the basis of this allelic variation, and I think that's a nice thing also that in natural variation, you should also deal with another question, what's the relevance of this variation in nature, uh, in addition to, of course, functional questions. Uh, that's the, maybe the embarrassing slide because you all know what it is. This is how you deal with QTL analysis. You make a cross, you make a mapping population, for instance, recombinant inbred lines, and important is that uh, if you have such populations, you have homozygous lines, so they are immortal. You can use them for many traits. And what you have to do is you have a quantitative trait, just a measure here, high and low values, and you look, is there an association with a specific region of the genome? So when it's red here, then it's high. When it's blue, it's uh, low. So there must be a locus here that uh, is involved in this trait. That's, that's simply to explain the principle of QTL analysis, and you can scan the whole genome and you may find additional places. Uh, so, so again, so there's something here that we have to zoom in to figure out what's the basis of this trait. And uh, at the end, you end up often with plots like this. So this is a chromosome, and you see at different places on the chromosome a bump, uh, a place where there is a significant association between a trait and a phenotype. The idea of uh, using genome-wide association mapping I tried to depict here. So we have uh, a number of genotypes that also in nature can intercross and that really goes over many generations and even in a species like Arabidopsis who is predominantly a cell for this occurs in nature at a few percent of, of even higher. And you get recombination events so you end up with your um, collection of Arabidopsis accessions uh, uh, that, that are, are like this, that are very different, derived from ancestral states, but have recombined. And what you then should look for, a place on the genome where, for instance, in this case, if you have a yellow allele, you are early flowering. If you have these other colors, you are late flowering. Okay, so there is something, there is a gene for flowering time at this position. Um, that, that's the principle, I think, uh, brief for association mapping. And the question, of course, is what population are you using here? How do you 
detect these associations? How do you determine the genotype of this, this uh, large number of uh, variations? So that's quickly, you can use the collection of accessions immediately, and you get, uh, you get also quickly to the gene, because this is a very accurate mapping, but there are a, a bit of a few pitfalls which I will mention hereafter. So uh, another way is to use this uh, to make crosses. I already uh, uh, take two accessions, you cross them, you make an F2, and from by single seed descent, by inbreeding, you end up in recombinant inbred lines that I already briefly mentioned. Uh, you can have some modifications of this, for instance, intercrossing such plants, you get more recombination events because that gives you a more accurate uh, mapping possibility and you make rails at a later phase. What's also, uh, what you also can do is start with such a hybrid and backcross it to one of the parents and end up with what we call integration lines or near isogenic lines. So where you have a, a little bit of the blue parent integrated, introduced into uh, the, the red parent. And of course, if there is a, a locus that makes uh, a difference, you should see a phenotype that differs between this one and the red parent. What is, uh, and this is good, we like to work with, uh, because in general, there's only one locus, one of the many QTLs that makes the difference here, so then we go back to monogenic inheritance. And another way to go back to monogenic inheritance, and this is also relevant for my talk hereafter, is that when you do this inbreeding, you reduce per locus heterozygosity with 50% every generation, but at an F6, F7 phase, you are not completely homozygous for all load sites. So you will find some residual heterozygosity in of certain in, in, in these generations. And if you then take a plant like this that is heterozygous and you self it, you can quickly isolate two homozygous lines that have the same genetic background but are differing at this locus. When there's a QTL here, okay, that allows you to zoom into this, this, this locus and study it in more detail. To the, so it's important that we can make these homozygous recombinant inbred lines. In Arabidopsis, it's a selfer, it's a short generation time, but uh, since uh, one or two years, we can do it even faster. So we can make dihaploids. Uh, so there are other plant species where you can make dihaploids by regenerating plants from microspores or from, from egg cells, and you get haploids, and then you double the haploids, and you get so-called dihaploids. In Arabidopsis, a recent uh, important paper was this paper of uh, Ravi and Chan in Nature, and what they did is they held, uh, had constructed, had obtained a genotype uh, where there was something a bit messy with the centromeres. Uh, the centromeres are functionally reasonable, but also not good in the parental line, but what is very exciting, if you cross it with a regular, with a normal Arabidopsis line, uh, that in the, in the zygote, these uh, chromosomes with the yellow centromere get eliminated very rapidly, and you end up with haploid plants. These haploid plants, uh, because there's no chromosome pairing, they are sterile, but sometimes spontaneous chromosome doubling occurs. And the good thing is Arabidopsis has many flowers, so there's a reasonable good chance to get a bit of doubling, and then you can easily see that because they see some silics growing out. And what you harvest there are plants that are then doubled, that have uh, the, the double chromosome. And of course, this is when you combine that, uh, this Sen H3 uh, variant with a hybrid, crossing two accessions, uh, what you get is, in fact, uh, haploids that are representing the gametes of this heterozygous plant, and by chromosome doubling, you get dihaploids. So uh, there are, yeah, we, we and many people are using this now to generate um, um, uh, recombinant inbred line populations. Uh, and in the past, we were a bit afraid of using late accessions because that took even in Arabidopsis too much time. But now we are not afraid of the late guys anymore because, okay. So what is the outcome of association mapping? I mean, this is a recent paper of the group of David Salt. Uh, very cool. He was looking at cadmium accumulation and bingo. This is what you want. Uh, it tells, this is the genome, 
five chromosomes of Arabidopsis and the significance of apparently a SNP or a few SNPs in this region that are significantly associated with the trait. And here you're really on top of the gene. Uh, that's what you want. Uh, but I should say we are doing many, many experiments like that. It's often not so nice as this one. So this is an experiment from our own group, from our, my PhD student, uh, Luis Barbosa. And, and yeah, you get peaks, yes, sometimes also of these nice streets or uh, uh, there's probably something to be careful. The, 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 this is the threshold, nothing above the threshold. Uh, so what does that mean? No. It probably means something that you have a peak here and there, but th th there are reasons why this is not getting to significance, and it, it's certainly one of the complications in uh, genome-wide association mapping. Um, I should say, for instance, in this region, uh, it's a bit highlighted, there's a really significant QTL uh, there. We have other ways how we did confirm that. Uh, so there is something in this noise, but it's not so straightforward as this previous example. And, yeah. It's a very common situation in, in many experiments, but it's, it's the good thing of association mapping. Uh, I try to put that here on the, uh, uh, on the summary slide. You get accurate map positions, hopefully on top of the gene, whereas when you do a standard QTL analysis, you still have a very broad region. You have to zoom in to, figure, to do fine mapping to get to the, the gene of interest. Uh, and you, that's another important point. If you want to exploit uh, the variation that there is, uh, only when you make a cross between two parents, yeah, it's only the difference between the two parents that you are looking at. Um, uh, but it creates a lot of false positives. There are issues of population structure. Epistasis is something I will come in the next part of my talk. Is, is a, a, a good reason why uh, the power of this type of analysis is poor. Uh, biparental rails have good power. You find QTLs also when they have a small effect, but the accuracy the, 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 uh, of the map position is not that good. So solution for these problems is in fact to combine both approaches. So uh, combi if you see a QTL in a biparental population, you believe in it. And then you start to look to uh, if there is a peak, even when it's not significant in this association mapping. And maybe that points to this uh, uh, candidate genes. Another way is to have uh, mapping populations that include more parents. And there are um, a number of these uh, situations there. Uh, very impressive. Uh, population is the so-called non-population in, in maize, uh, generated by Ed Buckler. So what he did, he took 25 genotypes of maize, very diverse set of genotypes, and crossed it to uh, uh, reference gene inbred line B73 and generated F1. And from the, each of these hybrids, he generated uh, mapping populations of real populations, common inbred populations of around 200 plants. So altogether, you get into a large uh, number of lines, which also increase your accuracy of mapping very much, and you exploit really the variation. And I think, uh, yeah, this is an extremely important population in maize. We have done a little bit like this, uh, more or less without thinking about calling it NUM or whatever. We simply were generating quite a number of uh, recombinant inbred line populations with a common parent, in this case Landsberg erecta, doesn't matter. And then we decided to, or let's say we did QTL analysis for a trait called C dormancy and, in, and combined, made also combined analysis because if you, you can analyze these data in each population separately and that works, for, no problem, you get good QTLs. But uh, when you combine it, you increase your accuracy. I have to put here an arrow because the, the, this uh, arrows indicate this confidence interval, so the inaccuracy of QTL mapping. But here, the, the, the confidence interval was extremely small. That's why I need to put an arrow here. And also, this one was quite small. These are QTLs that have been cloned, and they are really at the right position. Uh, again, it's not as good as some of the association. You're not on top of the gene, but it's not so bad. And this is, this is only 700 lines. This is not this 5,000 lines of Ed Buckler. So, uh, 
uh, and uh, so recently Paolo Kover published this uh, magic population which I understood are also made now in many other lines. So you intercross a number of founders, in this case for Arabidopsis, 19 founders, intercrossing, intermating, and then get this mixed recombinant inbred lines and, and yeah, exploit them uh, for, for, as a resource for genetic variation do mapping in it, but I think it's important, and I'll come to that uh, when I explain my, our own uh, multi-parent population, which we call Ampril, a little bit less fancy, Arabidopsis multi-parent real population. So what we did was we took eight parents and crossed them pairwise. We made four hybrids, and then we intercrossed the hybrids. So we made subpopulations um, that segregate for four parents, and then made recombinant inbreds out of that. Uh, we have, in the meantime, around thousands of such lines, and uh, this, this method, this, is, 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 the material was published in, in, uh, a year ago. And uh, what was the challenge also for me is exploit more of the variation than only in two parents, but also to be uh, aware of surprises, to see novel phenotypes due to AP stasis, due to that you need for a certain phenotype, one allele from one parent and one from the other parent, and maybe one from a third parent, I mean, to, to mix genomes. And this, uh, I will work out a bit in this example. I should say all the work that I'm reporting, also the, uh, the previous the story was all done by one postdoc, Chi uh, Ching Wang, uh, with help of my technician. And in fact, what we, did is we saw in this population a phenotype which was a bit unusual. Normally, if you take Arabidopsis uh, and you look to side shoots uh, on, the, on the main stem, so leaves have in principle an axillary bud that can grow out or not grow out into a side shoot, but in most of the time on the main stem, all the side shoot grow out. But suddenly we saw a few plants that didn't have side shoots, didn't have axillary mary stems at all, and we call this the MC axle phenotype, and we simply uh, quantify that by counting the number of stem leaves, choline leaves, uh, and the number of uh, leaves with stem, and just we use the ratio to, to, to uh, quantify and to do genetics. But what was special in this, for this phenotype, as you see here, is that we only had a few plants out of the 500 that we analyzed. So this is the frequency distribution of the number of rails and indicated here with these the colors are the ones that are uh, having a reduced number of filled side shoots. So most of the plants have uh, all have side shoots from every axle. So only, only the, the blue and the green ones are really a phenotype. Very low number. And of course we tried to map it. That didn't work. We could map flowering time and other traits, but this was too complicated. So how to solve, how to get this, to this genetic variation? And uh, there's already one thing very obvious. Uh, these plants with re this reduced shoot branching only occur among the late guys. So we had segregation for flowering time, yes, for sure. Uh, uh, I should say the parents in this case were all early, so there was no parent, I should have put arrows here, no parent that was uh, late, but uh, you have transgression, that's what's nothing new in Arabidopsis, we see this uh, quite often, but among the late ones, uh, you see this empty axle phenotype. So we said, okay, it doesn't work directly, let's go to brute force genetics and let's make mapping, take these lines, these genotypes as uh, new sources of genetic variation and simply cross it uh, with with uh, the parental lines, and again, don't try to, uh, uh, we, we, we made F1s, we made F2s, uh, uh, we did mapping in an F2, we generated F3 lines, we selected so-called HIFs, these, uh, we f uh, when we had map positions, we figured out lines that were differing only in two uh, alleles at one locus, and, and to confirm QTLs, and uh, that also uh, led, led to ultimately uh, fine mapping. So this is, uh, start again with your genetics, but uh, I, I like to emphasize 
that in F3, F4 lines, you can select these so-called HIF, heterogeneous inbred line families, uh, especially when you know about something about map positions, because then you can zoom into individual genes and also confirm these QGLs, that it's not false positives or whatever. So this is an example of such F2 populations. You see it segregates for uh, this RSB value, so one every Excel field here, nothing all empty, and then it's related to flowering time because we were uh, worried about this flowering time. We knew about the flowering time, AP says, only when they are late you see segregation here. And if you then check in this later generations and you have segregation for only one locus, you, you take a marker uh, that distinguishes the two alleles, uh, the three, and then you can distinguish the heterozygous. And then you see, okay, I confirm this QTL here. There is something segregating here closely linked to this, this marker. And uh, this link with flowering time was obvious, so we assumed that we could see flowering time genes also segregating, and this is an example here. Uh, you see uh, the three genotypes uh, affecting this RSB value, this parameter, but uh, only the ones that are late show this uh, really reduced branching. Um, so this is how we, we did our analysis, and it ended up with this picture that we identified uh, only taking two recombinant inbred lines from that population, that there were eight loci playing around to get that phenotype. So the, it's a bit surprising that there's so much genetic complexity, but you hardly see it. You have to, to dissect it. And of course, there's the flowering time I mentioned before. Again, we found our usual suspects, FLC, uh, Frigida, FT. Okay, there, that's, that's, that's the, the basis of apistasis. So earliness is apistatic to this reduced branching load side, which themselves don't affect flowering time, but only are expressed in the late background. And um, okay, another way to, to just start from the beginning with genetics is that our population was not highly inbred. We genotyped it in the F2, uh, did most of the phenotyping in the F5. That means you end up with residual heterozygosity. Sorry, do you hear me? Yeah, uh, I'm moving away from that. Um, and take as an example one of these lines that had that phenotype. It was heterozygous. You, you, I, I told you these have four parents. So uh, these lines are a mixture of these four parents. And uh, you can see where there are heterozygous regions. So in this case, uh, one, two, three, four, five regions were still heterozygous. And we knew that the progeny of this plant was segregating for that phenotype. So, okay, let's say that. So we look at these five markers, and these five regions, and uh, we see, look in the, in the progeny which one associates with this phenotype. And so not in this case, nothing. In this case, yes, bingo, a good difference between the two alleles, this one the same, this one the same, this one not. So in a quick way, looking in heterozygous inbred family derived from this F4 line, we could identify the segregation of four, three loci. That's not the whole story because I told you already before, there are at least eight loci segregating, but of course you have fixed some of them here. That, that explains it. So when you then take a plant so it's again the progeny, and you see uh, the effect of flowering time. So we follow here a marker uh, for the Frigida locus. This is the main flowering time locus, and you see only when the plants are late, you see segregation. When they're early, it's not there. But then you should do your genetics in this population, and there were two loads are segregating in an additive way. So uh, if you are late, if you are C24 at both alleles, you have a very low number here. If you're Columbia at both, uh, at, at both loads, say, you have a normal uh, branching pattern in the late background, and this as, as additive. So we said, let's zoom into this individual, um, um, uh, one of the loads, say, and, and uh, I, we also knew from the segregation analysis that C24 low value was uh, dominant, uh, and so what we did, what I, I'd like to show you here is a way how we present uh, this branching pattern, because we didn't talk about the rosette leaves. They have, in principle, 
actually buds that can grow out or stay dormant, but we really want, we look not at the outgrowth, not at say bud dormancy, but we look at the initiation of, uh, of um, actually buds. And, and in the rosette, there's no difference. Uh, most of the axles have uh, a meristem. It's really this stem leaves where the thing is different. And this is only looking at one of the loads, i fixing it for the other ones. And yeah, that's, that's the phenotype which we confirm in later generations. We did fine mapping uh, in the heterozygous progeny, 100,500 plants, and Chi Ching could, was able to, to map it to a region on the bottom of chromosome 5. That region still had was, was, was uh, still contained eight genes. So uh, instead of doing fine mapping, he said, okay, let's do the brute force method. I take, I clone all the genes from C24, which was a dominant parent, and transform them in the Columbia background. And um, uh, no effect of any of these genes. You, you keep the same level of this RSB value, only this one, bingo, uh, reduced this uh, this, this, this gave that phenotype of the C24 allele. And this, this was, uh, oh, I didn't, it's no secret, it's published already. This is AGL6. Um, um, and this gene, then we looked at the sequence, and there uh, was a, a lot of variation between C24 and Columbia in, in the promoter in DELS, uh, 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 nucleotide substitutions, but in the exons, in the introns, yes, also, but in the exons, only one amino acid change, so one non synonymous mutation occurred. Okay, we kept that in mind. The promoter was a good candidate for having variation, but uh, when you look at the gene, at the expression of the two variants, no differences, and uh, so. It, it didn't look like uh, that it would be a promoter uh, re mutation related to, um, to um, uh, differences in expression. We did, we didn't publish it. We did also some in situ hybridizations, but this is from a paper that was published on this gene. It was expressed in the right uh, uh, tissue. Uh, we also had similar results, but not nice enough to uh, publish. But, what Chi Ching did is said, now let's then figure out what's going on. We make promoter swaps, uh, and I should say we were helped by work done on this gene here in Uli Krossinklaus lab, um, and also got some mutants uh, from his group from Shower. Uh, but the important thing is was to make uh, constructs with the promoter swaps because it's a, a matchbox gene. We have to deal with uh, the uh, first the intron too, but. Um, so it's a number of constructs that are cDNA of C24 or Columbia with the two different promoters. But we also knew about that mutation uh, in the exon, and so he took the, the Columbia sequence and made side-directed mutagenesis, and then again did his transformation experiment, and it, it tells exactly the same, it tells a clear story. Um, if, if the promoter is, is Columbia or C24, that doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the cDNA you use. Uh, when it's C24, you get this low uh, the, uh, RSB value, but very important when you do the side-directed mutagenesis, the same story. So we, in this case, we identified the QTL up to the QTN, up to the quantitative trait nucleotide. And uh, apparently this is a, a gain of function type of uh, dominant negative uh, mutant. So, sorry, if I get uh, a quick, okay, we did also then, you do the population genetics, is this thing occurring in more accessions? Yes, you go then to the sequence data of Arabidopsis, 15% of the Arabidopsis accession have this, this, this C24 allele. But many of them don't show a branching phenotype that we on the next slide. It's not related to geography in an obvious way, but it, it, it's clearly this, this whole clade here is having the C24 allele. So it's an, a similar origin, but a lot of diversification already occurred. It's probably an old mutation. But when we then collected all these plants with, or a bunch of them that had this T, uh, and looked at this flowering time against branching, uh, all the early ones didn't show the phenotype, 
again, that's not surprising. This is epistasis. But uh, among the late ones, yes, we, the, when you are red, you have a good chance of being uh, reduced, showing this reduced branching. But there are also ones that have the Columbia allele that show a reduced branching. It tells again how complex this uh, genetic basis is. And it also tells that the message when you have such a situation of epistasis, even when you have 15% of your population has the right allele, but you, don't, you only see it in a few percent of these 15%, yeah, your power in your association mapping is, is really poor. It, it doesn't uh, work properly. Okay, the, the mutant that also that we got here from Zurich um, shows no phenotypes. Uh, that was already published. But if you bring it in the right background, you see exactly the same phenotype as you see in this uh, natural allele. So, in fact, we were dealing here with HL6, isolated 25 years ago. No real obvious function, but you really have to look in the right genetic background to see a function in a process that was uh, not seen before as uh, related to matchbox genes. Resequencing helps, I want to say that, but uh, and we have used the resequence data also to find markers to, to clone these genes. I just want to say this is sometimes things between, this is another project in the lab where we're studying a region in Landsberg which has an insertion of 70 KB that is absent in Colombia, and these are the type of complications uh, I don't want to talk now about, but okay, sorry. <laughs> Sorry to rush you at the end of the bit, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, it's my you, fault. <laughs> no, no, you need time to explain complicated things like this. Are there some questions? And so, regarding the geographic distribution of AGL6 uh, mutations, did you find any association with climatic conditions? No, no, we had a quick look and not, nothing obvious. And, and uh, the, there's one natural accession that has this phenotype also. That's Zurich number zero, okay. already existing for 50 years. That doesn't have this Columbia mutation. It uh, uh, doesn't have the C24 allele. So that are all that we are looking at that now. Okay. So do you have any explanation or do you have any hypothesis this mutation could be adaptive for Tadiana? No, 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 no indication. I mean, we don't even know what's the meaning of, the, of this phenotype, it's difficult to make a, a story on that. We are interested in, in, in the plant architecture, also Klaus Teres in our department works on this. I, I, I took it, I see it, I, that's why I gave the talk. This is an example of a novel phenotype, okay, with complex genetics. And that can be for any phenotype, I assume. Okay, maybe strong wind places, less branches, or, yeah, you can, I guess people can make a lot of hypotheses from now. Yes. Yeah, it's up to you, uh, make a hypothesis. <laughs> so, I, I don't have one. Really? The, the single nucleotide change that you see in the C24 allele, I mean, that cannot explain everything, right? I mean, you said, it is a cDNA that, if you swap it, that gives you that gives you the um, um, uh, suppression of the axillary meristems, right? Yeah, it's, but, but it's also the site-directed mutagenesis in the genomic part. The Columbia, yeah, yeah. the, the site-directed mutagenesis was done in the, the the complete gene promoter, everything from Columbia. Yeah. Only that amino acid changes. I, yes. I find that the most convincing so, so in argument. The, in the population, it seems to me the reason that you see it's such low penetrance really is 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 of this allele is, is it then actually suppressed or I mean, is it compensated by? by it, it's compensated by these additional load size. So, so uh, uh, let's say the phenotype where we worked with already also was homozygous for the C24 allele at this RSB2 locus. I mean, it, it's, you really need to look in the right background. So the, all these five other load size play a role in a fairly additive way. We have, there is no AP, there's AP stasis with respect to early flowering, but the other loads are additive, and you need to, to be in the right background to see um, a small effect. Uh, but it was workable. It, it had enough penetrance that we could work with that and could do the genetics without too much trouble.